Welcome to Thursday Night Bible Study with Apostle T. B. Walker. Good evening, everyone. I'm Apostle T. B. Walker. I want to take this time to welcome you to Thursday Night Bible Study in the Word. So certainly excited to have each and every one of you all here with me today as we're going to go into the book of 2 Thessalonians today. It's great, great to have you here. Certainly want to make sure that you feel welcome and that you welcome other people that you take this time to share. So make sure that you share uh, you know, what you're hearing today uh, through the technology of just pressing a button, but also with your mouth to, to share it, but also with your life as well. So listen, we're here in, in this Bible study to really break down the Word of God and also to see how this is applicable to our lives right now. Let's take a look at 2 Thessalonians. Hi, Mom. We're just going to look at two verses today, verses 1 and 2. Uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. I'm going to start at verse number 1 and end in verse number 2. And I believe we have that uh, uh, on the screen for you for those that are going to be uh, going along with us. Once again, that's 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, starting at verse number 1, ending in verse number 2. And here's what it reads. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the study that we take seriously and intentionally. God, we just know right now that you're with us. You said we're two or three are gathered together. In your name, you will be in the midst. We know that this is an accident that we're here, that you desire that we would have a closer walk with you, and that there's revelation that you want to give us that is going to be needful in this time. So we bless you. We thank you even now for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul is now ending up this letter. And I, I want to make sure that you are aware that we also, listen, we take questions here. If, the, if we're interactive, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to put those in the comments and we will read them out. I won't mention your name. Um, obviously, it's going to be in the comments, but don't hesitate. If you want to get the, your question uh, answered, we will do that live. Just make sure you put it in the comment. And I also like, to, you know, for you to, you know, participate. If there's some stuff that you uh, want to bring out, if there's some revelation that you want some more clarity on, please don't hesitate to reach out um, by your comment. But let's take a look at this. Uh, finally, my brethren, uh, pray for us. Now, you know, when you begin to look at this, Paul starts out, Paul, you know, obviously this is the great apostle. Paul, Paul has prayed, uh, you know, for a multitude of people. He's constantly in prayer. Paul uses the prayer often to let people know uh, his connection with them, that they are constantly in his prayers. But Paul is also, when you look through the scripture, you'll find out that Paul is constantly asking believers to pray for him. You know, in the book of Romans chapter 15, verse 30, here's what it says. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit to join fervently with me in prayer to God on my behalf. So he's asking them to join him in praying for him. Look at Ephesians, look at 2 Corinthians, look at, uh, again, it's, uh, 1 Thessalonians and Phil, uh, uh, Philemon. You'll see that the Paul is asking and soliciting prayer all over the place. And you know what? One of the things that Paul recognized was that his success, though not dependent alone on prayer, was directly connected to prayer. You know, that, that we're told to pray. Now, you know, prayer is a, is a major tool. It's a mighty tool, you know, that God has given us. And it, it behooves us as believers not to stand idly by and leave the work of spreading the gospel to missionaries over there somewhere or you know that's your pastor's job that's a that you know let's say those elders or deacons or you know missionaries or who uh, evangelists whoever they are that's their job no part of what we do is to pray god allows us to actually be a part of ministries what paul was actually telling them and and asking them to do was to be a part of the ministry and being a part of the ministry he doesn't say listen i need you to give you know, I'm going to need you to go out here and preach. No, he asked them to pray. Now, here's the thing. God has a sovereign plan, but he allows us to be a part of what he is actually doing. And there's too many people, too many believers, too many people in the church that are trying to do the work of God on their own without prayer. 
there's, there's too much promotion that happens in the church that's based upon, uh, you know, someone's characteristics, their, their, you know, their, their, their swag, their style, uh, you know, that, that all the, their charisma. And so much of the promotion is done by looking at the dynamics of their personality and never dealing with prayer. People are not promoted based upon prayer. Here's what the Lord revealed. It is, man, look at you. Look how you preached that first sermon. You are really awesome. That must make you this or that must make you that. You know what? We've got work to do and it's major and it's big stuff. So we need to come together and put our brains together instead of we need to come together and pray. And oftentimes when our brains come up lacking, we assume that it means not now. We don't have the resource. When we look at our money, if money's going to be the determining determining factor of whether we're going to do something or not, oftentimes God's plan to use us is hindered by us because we come looking for resources and not looking at him as the resource. Prayer recognizes that God is the actual resource. So here's the question. Can my prayer change God's mind? Can my, can my prayer change God's will? Can my prayer change God's plan? And, and if it doesn't, then what's the point in prayer? You know, as Paul is talking about this, you know, if, if I'm saying, listen, God has got a sovereign plan and he's allowing me to be a part of it. God's got a will that it's already set and settled in heaven. Then what's the point of me praying? Well, I can answer this. Prayer does not change God's mind. Prayer does not alter you know, the plan that God has. God has a perfect plan. He is sovereign, and he knows exactly how he's going to bring it about. But why pray? Well, well, God will use prayers to change certain circumstances. God will change, use prayer as a part of his plan to change situations. Prayer is not meant to change the mind of God. You know, we, we, you know prayer is not meant, you know, somehow God's planning on going this route. And we need to move his mind in another direction. He must be crazy. He must have lost his mind thinking he's going there. No, we're not praying to somehow alter God's plan and God's mind. But God can use our prayer to change circumstances to accomplish his work. It, it's a privilege. The truth of the matter is, it is God giving us this privilege. Paul is asking them to enjoin in with him in this privilege to pray to pray for the work of the ministry, to pray for the missionaries, to pray for him and the other missionaries that are there. Uh, listen, let me give you an example. Uh, you remember the night that Judas is, uh, he betrays Jesus and, and, and Jesus is going to the Garden of Gethsemane and, and Jesus says, uh, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Now, Jesus prayed. He's, his, his prayer was, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Did that change God's plan at all? No, not at all. Did that change the will of God that Jesus would die on the cross for our sins? Absolutely not. Well, let me tell you what it did. Prayer, because he prayed, prayer that enabled him to surrender to the plan of God. Look what he says. Nevertheless, not my will. He surrendered to God's will. Why are we praying? Listen, prayer will oftentimes move us and realign us with the will of God. Prayer is not, you know, we don't pray as people who know. The Bible says we don't know how to pray as we ought to. So we don't pray as people with perfect knowledge, with full panoramic view of God's plan. No. So God says pray. Why? Because he needs help with the plan? No, because prayer will sometimes be used to get you in line so you can say, God, I was praying my will. But nevertheless, you know what's been revealed in prayer? Your will. That's what prayer does. Sometimes God's will is actually revealed to us in prayer. Jesus says, here's all I can see, pain and suffering. So let me pray. He prays and all of a sudden what's revealed is, okay, God, I see your will. And now I'm going to yield and surrender to your will. So when we stop praying, we stop seeking an opportunity to be a part of God's work. He doesn't need us. But prayer is a key to successful ministry. So, as, you know, as we seek guidance, you know, to, to with the Lord in through prayer, seeking guidance from him, he allows us to yield to his will. So I want you to look at this. Uh, you know, because faithful prayer is really as important as faithful preaching. Uh, they go hand in hand. So Paul said, listen, we're going out to preach this gospel. We're going to come up against opposition. We need power with us. 
can you go to Cabela's and get us a 12-gauge shotgun? No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't go and say, listen, get the toughest guys you can from around the neighborhood and see if you can contract them to kind of roll with us to act as our muscle. No, Paul recognized where the power is. He said, listen, uh, I just want you to pray for us. And so we're going to go ahead and do this. We're going to preach, but we need power behind us that our enemies don't know is there. And look, look what Paul's talking about, though. Paul is not talking about fear, right? Paul says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly. What do you think about that? What do you think about that type of prayer? I'd love to hear from you and to hear what you're thinking. Listen, once you look at the first focus that Paul has when he's praying here, his focus is not on the messenger, the focus here is on the message. Paul is absolutely aware. He, Paul is not saying, listen, pray that there's a ring of fire around us. Pray that there's this big hedge of protection around us, that no harm and you know pain or danger could possibly come to us. No, Paul is actually saying, listen, pray that the, the word is guarded, that the message goes forth. You know, he's not really dealing with what can happen to the messenger because in the final analysis, Paul is absolutely 100% aware that it is the message that transforms people. We've gotten caught up with the messengers. We get caught up in the style of the messenger, the clothing of the messenger, and the messengers become superstars. And we follow the messengers for 30 years, never following the message, and have no idea that when the messenger, if the messenger goes down, what happens to us? We go down. Check this out. That's what's happening. That's what, why we're in this great you know, return in this great revival season right now. Let me tell you why we're in revival. Not only because we needed revival and because God exposed some things, but you know what? God took away the messenger from our faith and left us with nothing else but the message. And what we found out was that we don't really have an appetite for the message. We had a greater appetite for the messenger. We like the message. That's my pastor. That's my bishop. That's my apostle. We like them more than the message. We can sleep through the message. You know what? We show up for the messenger. Pastor, I know you'll be looking for me. I know you want me here. I gave you my word I'd be here. Okay, it's 11 o'clock. Sleep. Why? Because the word is going forth. How come? Because I never came for the message. I came for the messenger. So what Paul is actually saying, listen, I'm checking you out. When the pastor comes in, you stood up. You know, everybody stand and everybody stood up and you get great attention. When the music is going, you create going crazy. But now when the message is going on, you on your phone, you making, you texting, you making sure that, uh, hold on, let me go out here. because Put the roast on now, you know, because we'll be home in about an hour. I figure he'll be done in about an hour. And then, you know, once you finish doing your thing, then you can go in and amen for the last five minutes as if you were really focused on the message. Now, obviously, this isn't everybody, right? And I don't want to be critical, you know, as if this is everybody. But th there has been a problem in the church that it stopped being an institution of prayer. And so, again, Paul is now talking about not only the power of prayer, right? But he says, listen that the word of God would actually not meet any obstacles, not us. Now, obviously, if the word will go forth, then the messengers are also you know, protected as well. So, but look at this confidence. Paul has confidence in the word of God. Paul views the word of God as precious, and he knows if we get this out, it's going to change lives. And I know the enemy is going to try to hinder it. The, the very nature of, the very nature of such a request that like this, like that we're going to go out and preach this gospel. Satan and the world is always at work to do one thing, to hinder and push back the gospel. It, 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 Paul knows that the Satan is going to try his best to erect barriers to stop him from preaching the gospel. That's what he's trying to do with you. He's trying to erect those barriers now. And that's why this message is so important, because we need to ask people and begin to solicit people to pray for us. You know, strong people, people who think that, you know, I've got it together. You need prayer, because if you have it together, Satan knows you have it, has it together as well. He knows that you are a serious adversary and is going to put up stumbling blocks to your work, to the message. Now, this doesn't matter if you don't have any work. This doesn't matter if you're like, ah, I've been saved for 20 years and I don't know what my ministry is. Okay, you're on the sidelines right now. So, yeah, I want you to get in the game, but just know this. There's no attack against you. 
You know what? It's, I mean, the, the attack is already working. If you love Jesus and have been saved by grace and you are still on the bench, listen, his attack is actually working. So my job here with you is to shake you up to make sure you realize nobody's coming against bench warmers. This is a good message so you can hear it. But know this, the attack is not for you. Ain't nobody coming against people who are not playing the game. This is Satan coming after Paul because Paul was in the business. He was in the mix. Paul was about it. So it's about it's about believers now that are about it, that ought not be shocked that these things are happening. Listen, the gospel is meant to have a progressive course. And so when you look at this, Paul knew the gospel is like a river. It's supposed to be flowing. So he says, pray that the gospel goes worldwide. Pray that the gospel goes wider than we ever expected before, before until every city that we're going to is overflowing with the knowledge of the word. The gospel cannot be stationary. Get this. Your church cannot be stationary. The church is supposed to constantly be moving. The fact that you're on that corner for 50 years does not mean that's moving. Listen, there's a puddle of water that can stay in a place for a long time, but that puddle is stagnant. That puddle is polluted. That puddle has, it, it, you cannot be used with, it will make people sick. And so what you will find out is that we've got stagnant pools here. That Paul is not saying, cut them down, tear them down. No, Paul has said, get in the flow. The reason why you're polluted, the reason why there's always drama at the place, the reason why folks are backbiting, because there's no new blood coming in, because there's no new power being seen, there's no new testimonies going forth, and there are no, there's no new victory that the church is experiencing. And I want you to understand, God is about to open doors for the church to experience victory like never before, in spite of adversaries. But the prayer request here, is about the work. And, I, you know, listen, what you got to wonder, if Paul is praying that the work is not hindered and saying, pray that the work is not hindered, that the word goes forth, that it runs swiftly, I wonder how many hindrances come about as a result of us not praying. I wonder how many things are that, that, that really would actually move so much smoother that, that actually hit stumbling blocks and roadblocks and all met and hit, ran into some of the barriers because we didn't pray. So here's what the Lord said. Uh, my word will not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and prosper in the things for which I've been sent. God is promising. He's, he's actually put out there and said, listen, the word is going to go forth. So if God has promised it, again, why should I pray? Because we knocked down circumstances. God didn't. God is allowing us the privilege like unlock that door. Prayer is going to unlock a door that the enemy was trying to lock against gospel. So pray and unlock the door. God is already saying, I've already unlocked the door. You pray and it will just fly open so those that are in front of it will see it. We have a part in this. Our prayer is not futile and nothing. And Paul said, listen, pray not only that the word of God would go, that it would speedily go forth, but it says, and be glorified. It, it, I want it to be honored. Listen, people are going to honor it when they see the authority that is actually in the word. When they receive the glorious truths that are in the word and their growth in their own lives, they are going to honor God. And he says, listen, it's the same way it was with you. They, they are a living example. And listen, when we look at it, we are looking all over for miracles. And Paul says, listen, remember yourself. Part of your motivation to pray has to be the knowledge that people were praying about you before you came into the fold. People were praying that you would come unto the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, now look at you as a result of our prayer. Look at you as a result of the prayer of other saints. So we came to Thessalonica on the prayers of other saints that, other, that folks would get saved. And, says, and so the word of the Lord came to Thessalonica and then it spread abroad. And it, it says that in every place your faith has gone forth. So they were not some shining city on a hill. Until the word of God came and lit them up. And he says, look at yourself. If this can be done in you, this could also be done in them. So I want you to look at this. Paul is saying, I want you to pray that what's happening in Thessalonica will happen in Corinth. You know what? How often do our prayers stop when we get what we want? How often do we stop praying? You know, I mean, I mean you know, how many people have solicited prayers but have never interceded? That are not about praying for other people. Paul is saying, listen, 
I want you to want this duplicated. I mean, if you're on fire for Christ, how can you want... L listen, let me, let me just challenge this. I'm not sure if you're on fire for Christ if you don't want other people to have that fire. I'm not sure if that's Christ fire. Now, I didn't say you weren't on fire, but on fire for Christ, it compels people to tell somebody. Whenever you've seen it in the Word, it has compelled people to do one or two things. They've got to come back to Jesus as one of the lepers did. And, and proclaim it. They've got to go out and praise God, or they've got to go tell it. Even when the Lord says, "Shh, don't tell anybody. Don't, don't, don't say anything." Listen, I believe we have a question. Yes. Good evening, Apostle. Good evening. So when we say, "I'm going to just leave it in God's hands and stop praying about a situation," does that hinder us or our prayers from getting answered? No. I mean, again. It doesn't hinder our prayer from getting answered. The issue isn't heaven because getting a a, a, a prayer answered would be the 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 I guess the realm, if you will, of God. He's the one who answers prayer, right? So he's not going to leave that up to us whether he's going to answer or not. That will put us in an extremely powerful position, way too powerful for people who are created by this God. What it does, though, if we stop praying, oftentimes prayer opens the door for us to see the plan of God, to see, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So when I, if I stop praying, not only will it hinder me from seeing, wow, God has given me an answer, but it will hinder me from being able to bend my own mind and suspend, literally yield my will to his will to be able to see an answer that I don't like. Oftentimes, we stop praying because we, A, don't think God's going to give us an answer, or circumstances seem to indicate he has an answer yet, when he may have. So, you know, not only is it about whether we stop or start praying, but it is how we pray. If we are praying with a mind to do God's will, or if we're praying to motivate God to see it our way. That's so that's so yeah, we, we need to continue praying. And that's why Paul tells them, and it's why the gospel says, men ought to always pray. Pray without ceasing. So it isn't God, I'm praying because I want to get that thing. It need, needs to be God, I'm praying because I want to see your plan concerning that. I don't know. I, I know I don't know how to pray as I want. I want this sickness cured. So I'm praying for healing. But part of my prayer is to see what is your will concerning that? Because of that, I don't know. So we need to continue to pray without a doubt. And it will hinder us, but it won't hinder God from blessing us. It may hinder us from seeing that God has blessed us. Or when he says no, it will hinder us from seeing that the blessing is in the no. So hopefully that helps. And then answer that question. If there's more questions, please don't hesitate. Fire away. So let's take a look at this. Um... You know, Paul gives the, the children of Thessalonica, he gives this church a really high commendation. And, and, and it's an encouragement, too, that, that they, they continue on. But Paul says this. He says, and this is our last verse. He says, and, and I want you to pray that the gospel goes forth, that, that the word of God is glorified, and also that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for, all, for not all have faith. That's the final verse. Now, Paul is, has been exposed to dangers before, and he knows that when he goes to Corinth, it appears that this will be kind of the same. And so, as he prays here, Paul is not praying just about self-preservation. Paul is also praying about the work here, that though it appears. I mean, I know this appears because Paul has got, you know, opposition from some fanatical Jews. Paul has opposition that's coming not only from inside the house from the Jews, but he's also got it from the Greek philosophers. He's got it from false prophets and false teachers. So he's asking these th the people from Thessalonica, I mean, not for himself, because the Bible says that he says he counted not his life dear to himself. He wasn't worried about himself, even though in this, this human man, there is some self-preservation there. Paul's not chomping at the bit to get beat down. You know, he's not... He's not, like, you know, salivated at the thought of like, yeah, another another beating, another whipping. No way. No way. But Paul knows I'm the messenger. And that if we get killed, the message won't go forth. 
if if they are able to stop us and you know even in, imprison us, if if they're able to to you know to, to blind us, the message won't get won't go forth. We're surrounded by people who are designed to hinder this message. And I know this, Paul is not ever saying, don't pray for their change and their salvation, because that's a part of the prayer. You know, as Paul says, listen, I want you praying that we are delivered. That deliverance can also come with their deliverance. If they get delivered and join the team, they no longer are against us. The Bible says that those that are, those that are for us, they're, they're not against us. Right? So, so it's clear that there's a lot here. But Paul says, but now, I do want you to pray against their ability to impede the word. This is not a prayer that he's like, God, get them. Kill them right where they are. Twist them up. Hopefully they have a stomach ailment. No. This is now, I, we need to make sure that there's a divine restraint on them so that there's an open flow with the word. How come? Paul says, before not all have faith. That's, that's, that's what he's dealing with. Listen, Satan is powerless against the word. I want you to understand that. So when the word is accurately proclaimed, there's nothing that Satan can do. The gates of hell should not prevail against the church. There's nothing Satan can do. He can deny it. He can attack it. Attack it. He can call it a lie. You know, he can do all those things, but he can't subtract from it. He can't take anything away from it. So when you begin to look at it, the primary attacks are going to come against those who proclaim it, right? Satan can't attack the message, the, the, right? He can't kill the message. The gospel is going forth with people scoffing. The religious leaders of the day, the, the, the big shots of the day, couldn't stop Jesus. This one guy from Galilee from turning the whole city upside down. They, they couldn't stop that. The, the, they had to actually come and say, Lord, please, listen, ask your disciples to stop uh, all this praising. You know, I mean, if, 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 and Jesus said, well, listen, if I tell them to stop, the rocks will start crying out. You know, you guys are powerless against this. There are no systems, but people can kill us. They can kill the body. And Paul wasn't saying, don't let them kill me. Paul said, your prayer is a prayer of rescue and deliverance of the boat that's carrying the message. So when you begin to look at that, Satan has got people under his influence, and he's going to use those people even in this time right now. What does Paul say? Well, there's, they, they'll all have faith. And so when you look at this, those that don't have faith here that Paul is talking about are going to kill. They're going to maim. They're going to distract from the truth of the word. They're going to detain people. The Lord said, don't be shocked. They're going to throw you before the magistrates. So in some way, they're going to try to tempt through deception to move people away from the gospel or to negate the testimony of the minister. That's what the word, that's what the enemy's doing right now. Look at TV, look all over, trying to literally poke holes at the gospel. Try there's I mean there's no funnier joke today on any circuit than the, the joke about the church, right? Joke about preachers. And I mean you connect the church to pedophilia, connect the church to graft and corruption. Connect the church to adultery and lies. And that's eventually, over time, that's what the world is trying to make the church out. They're, they're nothing but charlatans. They don't want anything but your money. They don't care anything about you. Look at old Slick Willie over there. He, you know, he's pre preaching with one hand, but he's over there touching your wife with the other hand. That's how they want to portray the church. Know this. Nothing can stop the gospel. But Paul is saying the enemy is going to try to hurt us so that we won't be able to preach. And so when you begin to look at this, he's, the meaning here is that like, they don't have faith in the gospel. No, it is not that they don't have the attitude of faith. Paul is saying these are people who don't want it. They're, they're people who believe the devil's lies, who believe the lie that religion is, at, you know, this faith is actually for certain people. This is not really for me. Paul said, listen, this is a group of people that don't have faith. They're not receptive at all to the word. You have to know that there are some people out here right now. As people are looking and say, maybe I didn't say the right thing. No, there are some people out here that are not receptive to the word. As you are sold out to Christ right now, there are people that are sold out to being anti-Christ right now. Right? The spirit of antichrist is not some big guy that's going to come. No, he, that's the Antichrist, right? But the spirit of Antichrist is carried by this group of people who simply will refuse to believe the gospel. They have the capacity to understand it, but they refuse it. 
They refuse it. They have no desire to know more about Christ. And if they were to get it, they would reject it. They are rejecting it. So when you begin to look at this, it's no need to wonder, like, what's Paul praying about? He's praying about people that lack any sympathy for Jesus. What sympathy are they going to have for Paul? What sympathy are they going to have for Barnabas? What sympathy are they going to have for other missionaries? Listen, this is not about, uh, again, a history lesson. But we have missionaries all over the world right now that need prayer. We have, miss seriously, missionaries that are doing serious work right now that need the saints to come together and pray. And I think that sometimes, you know, we are thinking about, well, you know what? We, I mean, we've got Bishop Johnson coming in for the revival next week. So we're praying that the church revival will go forth. We're trying to raise $5,000 to make sure that we are able to do this or buy the van. And so we get used to praying for an event and not recognize that God is saying, listen, when you're praying, it's not just about like, and cover, cover my house and put an angel in the front of my house. No, I want you to think about some people that are on the front lines that have left their homes today, that have said, God has called me to, uh, you know, to, to these islands. God has called me to this dangerous mission. God's called me to Jordan. God has called me to Kenya. You know, I'm, I'm going to evangelize in China. God has opened a door in Russia, and he's called me to go there, and I'm going. There's a person with their ticket right now, catching a red eye. They're going to stop somewhere. You know, they're still stop in California. Then they'll stop again in, in, you know, Germany. Whatever their layover is going to be, there are people that need our prayers right now that are about to start something that will be perilous because as they are starting their journey, there's also people who are sold out against them who are also waking up thinking the same thing. Where can I hinder? What can I stop? How can I put a roadblock in front of the gospel? And you know, Paul wanted God to either change these people. Because that's what the prayer is about. Either change them into godly, reasonable men or deliver me from them. That's not, you know, I want you to look at that. Because this is how we ought to pray. This is, Paul didn't say destroy them. Rescue me from them so I can do my work. And in my work is them. If they are at bay, they can hear the work. And Paul knew. You know, Paul knew. He, he recognized that how this worked because that's what he used to do. Remember, Paul used to persecute Christians. So Paul knew what was going to happen because he used to do it. He knew exactly how it was going to happen. So when you begin to look at this, Paul isn't shocked at the violence that's coming his way because he realized, I know what the enemy placed in me. I know how vigorous I was against Christians. And I knew that I actually thought I was doing God's service. I thought I was doing the right thing. And that can be the most dangerous. But nothing can hinder the plan of God. God says, listen, Pray right now and there's some windows that'll be closed. Pray right now and there's some eyes that'll be closed. That there's some people who won't see them darting down the road and they'll be able to get away. There's some people that are going to be able to get from the warlord the permission to build a well. Simply because you prayed. God's will was always there. They're going to build that well. They're going to build that school. The work that he sent them to do is not going to be hindered. But one of the ways that it's not going to be hindered is this privilege that God says, because you prayed tonight, that the work will go forth. Because you pray tonight that someone who was going to be killed would not be killed. That somehow that the bullet would get jammed in the gun. You didn't even realize that you prayed about God says, I'm not going, I'm going to deliver them. Your prayer was God jammed the gun. And you had no idea. God turned their heart. Don't let them do it. Provide for them. Send the resources. Those are the things we need to be thinking about. So, you know, as we end our Bible study tonight, I hope that you really begin to see not only the, the, the global perspective of the gospel, but the true kingdom perspective of the gospel. We're joined together. And like in this time, more than ever, we get to really see we're joined together more than by a denomination. We're, we're joined together more than by our connection to a building, you know, a, a, your convention, your convocation. We're, we're, we're bigger than Baptist, Methodist, Pentecost. We're, it's larger than that. God has called us to see saints in the spiritual realm all over the world. And as we are looking to get involved, you know, there's a way to get involved in your local church. But your prayer gets you involved in the kingdom 
globally, worldwide. So tonight, you know, as you prepare, you know, to, to pray before you go to sleep, as you maybe just be praying as you're walking, think about a missionary that's out in the field today. Think about somebody that's in a precarious and a dangerous situation. Think about people who are about to start their lives and their missionary journey. People that are leaving jobs and leaving homes for an undetermined period of time because God has called them. And listen, it's not a weird thing. Maybe he, he hasn't called you to do it. Maybe God has said, listen, you stay on your job and continue to do what you're doing. But I want you to join in with that missionary going to Africa. I want you to join in with that missionary that's going to the you know, Canada. I want you to join in now with that missionary that's heading out to uh, Chicago, that's, you know, Philadelphia, Florida, wherever they are. I want you to join in with them tonight in prayer that the word of God would move swiftly and that there will be absolutely no hindrances. And for those that are in dangerous and precarious situations, that you would pray for them, that they will be delivered from these unreasonable and evil men. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I certainly appreciate you being here. And listen, one of the greatest ways you can support this ministry, we always appreciate your seed, but one of the greatest ways you can support the ministry is by sharing. So I want to thank you in advance for sharing, getting this gospel out, spreading this gospel, because somebody's going to need to hear this. And who knows, one of your friends... You know, as you share this, one of your friends may be one of those missionaries. You know, one of those people that you just selected as a friend. Maybe looking at Facebook, maybe looking at a YouTube, maybe looking at a website right now. And needs to hear this message that I didn't make the worst mistake of my life. And the fact that I am surrounded by adversaries. I have people who are praying for me so that the word of God would actually move swiftly and would absolutely be honored wherever it goes. God bless you. Have an awesome Thursday.